You know, there's something about worshiping from a desperate place. I can feel it in the room, man. Some of y'all are coming in with some stuff. And the reason why I know is, man, I've been in a desperate place waiting for Jesus to break through in my life. And I want you to, I want you to know that tonight, if you let him, he's going to break through. I believe that right now. I'm fired up. I'm ready to preach this thing from the front to the maps in the back. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm ready to go. Because, man, this is, this is big. This is your life. This is your future. This is eternity, man. God wants to intersect every aspect of your life. I don't think it just wants to be once a week. I think he wants to meet with you every day. That he wants to so shake up your world to know that he loves you. That, 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 that we just have to be in that place where we're ready to receive. So I hope that you're ready tonight because I'm ready to, to give whatever I got. I might change the whole sermon up. I don't know. I just, there's just something different that y'all are bringing in the room, and I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, for those of you who don't know me, and my name is Blake, I'm, not, I'm the college pastor here. I'm not Kyle or Terrell, as you can probably tell, but um, they have asked me to come preach the last uh, installment of our series, I See a Church. And what we've been doing in this series is we've been looking at Acts 2 at the early church, and we've been taking a picture, a snapshot of that church, and, and seeing how God used them, and seeing how maybe we can become like that church, because I believe it's God's heart to not just do something once, but that he is in the constant business of making his church more look more and more like Jesus. And so I am excited about wrapping up this series. We are going to be in Acts chapter 2. If you have a Bible, turn in there, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 46, Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Um, but before we do that, I know that some of you might not know your neighbor, and so what I need you to do right now is I need you to reach over to your neighbor and say, hey neighbor. Don't be afraid to talk to your neighbor now. Hey neighbor. I've been waiting all week to sit next to you. Come on, come on, come on. For those of you looking for the other neighbor, it's not going to happen tonight, but that's okay. Y'all talk to him after service, all right? So, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 40, 46. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. It says, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and they broke bread from house to house and they ate their food with a joyful and generous heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Y'all want to work from the title tonight. We got fires to fight. Touch your neighbor and say, we got fires to fight. No, I don't think you heard me. We got fires to fight. We got fires to fight. You know, growing up as a kid, you know, they, the, the, the one question that you ask children is, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you know, me, I grew up a little differently than everybody else. I had parents that strongly uh, believed that I should be all of myself, all of, all of me, not to be like anybody else, but to be an original, right? That's what they always said. So I grew up a little bit differently than everyone else. I say that because when you ask normal kids, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? Most of the time they say, oh, I want to be a nurse. I want to be a teacher. I want to be the president. I was not one of those children, and neither was my sister. For a, a substantial amount of my, li my young life, uh, my sister, she was dead set on being a princess. That was her thing. I'm going to be a princess. That was her, that was every Halloween princess, period. That was it. And me, I'm even a little bit more further along. If you can't tell, I'm already loud. I like to draw a lot of attention. That's just who I am. Sorry, mom and dad. That's how I grew up. Prayers for them. They made it through. But I grew up wanting to be a Power Ranger. Y'all know about this if you were there on Tuesday night when I brought it up, but that's because I come from that place. I watched every single one of the TV shows, the movie, the whole thing. I had the outfit. I had the moves, all of that. I was dead set on being a Power Ranger, so much so that if anybody was to ask me, hey, Blake, what do you want to be when you grow up? I looked them right in their eyes and said, I'm going to be a Power Ranger, period. I'm going to be the Black Ranger specifically because I think black looks good. But anyway, all that to say, I was going to be the Black Power Ranger. I really was. I was dead set on it. Told everybody and their mom, I'm going to be the Power Ranger. And they're like, no, you're not. And I said, First off, you don't know me. I got moves. I will karate, anyway, I, I, all the things. But I, I grew up wanting to be a Power Ranger so badly. But there was this one moment in my life that things started to change. Yes, I still, you know, enjoyed Power Rangers, but just something just, just shifted in, in that for me. And, and I don't know, uh, some of you grew up, uh, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, like that was like your like upbringing, but I'm all of a 90s kid. I was born in 91, I'm a little older, but I grew up right in the thick of the 90s. And I don't know if it was like this for y'all, but 90s field trips 
were awesome. They were so dope. When I, when, see, y'all don't get it because nowadays you have to sign 16 parental consent forms and have a doctor's note and have all your medication and all the, all the things that has that. My parents used to just send me on the bus. You better go. You better behave. And if I hear back, you're going to get a whooping when you get home. That was the situation. Okay. That was all the instructions that were given. So I get put uh, at this daycare and I'm at this daycare and normally they would take a lot of field trips. And the way that these field trips work is if you were a good kid, you get to go on a field trip. But if you were one of those kids that just, I was a good kid, but I was a loud kid. You see, there's kind of a difference. I wasn't a bad kid. I was a loud kid. I liked attention. I, I liked to draw the room. I wanted to put on a show and stand on the table and do all the things. And my teachers didn't like that. And so there was this thing that my teacher used to do in daycare. And she used to say, hey, Blake, what we're going to do right now is we're going to zip our mouths and we're going to throw away the key. And I was like, I'm not throwing away the key. My mouth is open, lady. I, this is my time. I don't know what you're trying to do, but this is my time right now. Little did I know that there was a field trip coming up. And this is the first field trip, not the field trip that changed everything, but this is the field trip before the field trip. And on this particular field trip, this is when the movie Pocahontas came out for the first time. Y'all know Pocahontas? So Pocahontas came out and I was so excited about Pocahontas. I was like, hey, I'm on the table like Pocahontas. Yeah, like all of four years old, right? And the teacher said, hey, Blake, I need you to calm down and be quiet or you're not going to be able to go see Pocahontas. And so I said, as any child would, with all the confidence that I had in my mom, I said, I don't care. My mama take me. And I did not go see Pocahontas. <laughs> and my mama did not take me in the timing that I thought she would, but she did end up taking me to see Pocahontas. But I missed the field trip. I had to sit behind and not go. And I was devastated. So this next time, when this next field trip opportunity came up, I was so excited, y'all. I was, I was like, I'm going to be a good kid. I'm going to like zip it and throw away the keyboard. She even says anything. I'm going to sit. I was sitting Indian style. I can't do it. I'm bow-legged, so it's easy for me to get Indian style. But like I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I'm going to be the best kid on the planet. I'm going on this trip. Best believe. In Jesus' name, I will be on that trip. And I went on the trip because I was a good kid this time. But this trip was different than the other trips that we took. This trip was the coolest trip of my young life. We went to a fire station. If any of y'all have been to a fire station before, it's lit, literally. It's actually awesome. They take you in there. There's these stupid, awesome fireman's poles that you get to jump and slide down. I like went in line like 10 times. Like it was almost like I was uh, like at, at like a, a amusement park or something. I just was in go, just riding this, this thing. And then the next thing was they, they put all the equipment out, the boots, the, 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 the overalls, the helmet, the, the mask, like all the stuff. And so I'm, I'm all of this tall and I'm, and I'm in these boots that are way too big. And the thing is way too big and the hat's way too big and the, I'm just putting it on. I'm taking it all in. And the last part of this field trip was actually my favorite, favorite, favorite part. And it wasn't all the, all the fun things because there was one part of the, uh, the fireman's outfit that I specifically didn't get to be a part of because like I said before, I wanted to be a power ranger and there was this ax that the fireman would carry. And my teacher said, do not let him near that ax because he will swing it because he thinks he's a power ranger for real. And the dude was like, for real? And I said, for real, bro, let me get near that ax. Somebody getting it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, so after that part, there was this one part that was my absolute favorite part. And it was the time where they show us the fire truck. And I don't know about you, but fire trucks are stupid awesome. They're like huge, long, big red with a ladder on the top. There's hoses everywhere. Like it's cool. Like you see them driving and you're like, I would love to drive that thing. All of four years old, never driven anything in my life. But I was like, I'm gonna drive that fire truck. I'm gonna drive it. And my moment came, my moment came. The firemen, they, they, they got us all together and they say, hey, we need a volunteer. And I said, ooh, ooh, me, 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 me. And if you're the loud kid, you get annoying and they just say, okay, we want him. So I got chosen, right? And I'm excited. I, I run up, I jump. I want to say I had a Power Rangers shirt on. Like I was like ready. And uh, they, they, the guy picked me up and he put me in the front seat and I'm in the, I'm in the vehicle and I'm seeing all these switches and these levers and all these different things that make the fire truck, you know, do fire truck things, which I didn't understand at the time. I just knew one was for the hose, one was for the ladder. And then there was this one that was this red button. And if you know anything about kids, they love red buttons, especially if they're not supposed to touch them. And I'm looking at this guy like... Can I touch it? 
He looks at me, he goes, you want to touch that button, huh? I said, yes. He said, well, do you want to touch it? I, I touched it without him even giving me permission. I hit it and the siren goes off and the lights start flashing. Little did I know that the doors were all closed. It was extremely too loud. We were inside. It was not outside. It was not a good deal, but the lights turned on. He quickly just went and pressed it and turned it off. But I literally could have died in that moment, a happy like four-year-old. It, it was the best thing that ever happened in my life. I got to press the button that made the lights go and the sound go. And I was so excited. And then he said, do you have any questions about the fire truck? And I said, yes. Why is there this button on the fire truck? He said, well, the, the siren, the sound and the lights tell people that there's an emergency and that we're on the way. And I was like, oh, okay. So people know that you're, you're on the way towards something when these things are on. He goes, yeah. He said, even this is also a thing when you turn it on people, when they're driving down the road, will actually pull over on the other, the other lane. Some of you don't do this, but you should, um, <laughs> they pull over into the other lane. So they make room for us to pass by because, and I was like, I, as a four year old, it's so hard to con like conceptually understand that putting, pressing a button makes people move in a, in a certain direction out of your way. And I was so confused. I said, okay, please run that. Explain that to me again. I didn't say that. I said, what do you mean? You know, kids ask a thousand questions and like, why, why, why? I, I wide this guy. And he basically said, people get out of our way when this is turned on because they know we're on our way to help somebody. And, and, and as I'm reading this text, I can't help but see that this church, they had something that they were known for. Because this, this key verse in verse 47, it's, or verse 46, it said, that they had favor with all the people, that they had grace with all the people. For me, this is saying that because the church was known for something, people made way for the church. Sometimes I think that today's church, we've forgotten our occupation. I feel like some of us in here feel like the church is a place that you go to get your healing and all, and that's very true. But this is the other thing about church that you need to understand. This church is not a building that you come to, but it's people that you are. And not only that, but if you are a part of this body, if you have bowed the knee to Jesus and said, I'm all in on this, you are no longer just this bystander that gets out of the way. You're actually a firefighter. You're actually a firefighter. You got fires to fight. I believe that if we're going to be a church for this city, which I believe God has placed us strategically where we are in this city to be a church that meets the needs of a city. And if we're going to be people that meet the needs of other people, and if they're going to make way for us, we need to be known for some things. One is we need to be known for helping. Second, we need to be known for stepping into fires with people. My first point today, if we're going to be a church for the city, if we're going to be a church that people make way for, we need to be people who show up. We need to be people who show up. I don't know if you know this about firemen at all, but part of the job of a firefighter is they go and they stay in this place and whenever something happens, they get a phone call. When that phone call happens, they, they load up and they go to the to go to the spot. They don't actually wait to find out what's going on. They don't wait to find out who started the fire. They don't need to know the story. They just need to know that there's a fire and it's their job to be on the way. Some of us in this room need to realize that there are some people's lives who are on fire right now. They're waiting for you to just go and show up in their life. That is our job as the people of God to put out fires in people's lives. That is our job. And that is not just a job that, that I'm coming up with, that I'm thinking from this text, but it's actually something that is extremely biblical. It is throughout this entire book that God has always, he has designed his people to always, always be the people who image him in the world. That God's design is for the people of God to image the person of God. That we would be the people that carry out what his character looks like in the earth. Don't believe me? Check this out. If you would, Later on, just, I'm not going to read the verse. I'm just going to tell you where it is. Go read through the book of Deuteronomy. Some of you are like, where is Deuteronomy? I don't know what that is. No one ever told me. It's in the very first parts, first five books of the Bible. Open it up. A man named Moses wrote it. And what it is, is God, essentially, he's taking these people out of slavery, out of Egypt. If y'all know the story, if not, go read Exodus. He brings them out and he brings them into the wilderness. And then he prepares them to go into this land that he promised them. And not only that, there's this first generation that, that kind of just doesn't trust God. And they're, that, that first generation says, no, we're not going to go in the land. We're going to stay back. But this second generation is, is raised up. And Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means second giving of the law. So essentially, the book of Leviticus, right before that, God has given the rules and the regulations 
situations for these people to live uh, so, so that a holy God can live amongst the midst of a sinful people. That's why Leviticus exists. If you understand that at all, that's a summation of what that book is. But the book of Leviticus says, hey, this is how you're going to live in the land so that I'll bless you, I'll be with you, and you'll be a blessing to the nations, essentially, right? But that's to the first generation. The second, Moses gives this sermon to the second. And what he says in the book of Deuteronomy is that, that no, not only are you supposed to be a people that live in relationship with me, with God, but you're a people that in your economy, there are going to be things that are set up so that you are a people that care for others. What they told him, and what, I'll just give a little piece of what this piece of Deuteronomy is. You can go back and read it later. But Moses, he would tell these people, this, when you go into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, this land that's good, that's flowing with milk and honey, that whole thing, when you get in there and you set up your life and you build farms and places for yourself to live, what I want you to do is I want to take that, that first fruit, right, and I want you to give it to the Lord out of trust, out of relationship with God, right? Then there's this other part of this. In their fields, like you think of a field, right? There would be these edges of the field, these corners of the field that, that Moses would say, leave the edges of your field not cut, leave everything there. So you would see a, fil- a field with everything taken out. Think like weed or something. Everything would be gone except these edges. And what would happen is that the, the foreigner, the, the orphan and the widow, those who couldn't uh, like, uh, supply any free- anything for themselves, those who were needy would come to that and they would take And so God, even in the economy of his people, set it up so that people that were in need were cared for. Not only that, but in Isaiah, when when God has has brought these people in land and they have returned back to their old ways and left God and and not obeyed him and not listened to his voice, but they've kept this type of uh, religion religion where they just go to the temple, they do the thing, they do the rote, like, oh, well, I'm at church. Okay, great, all right, great, that whole thing. And he says in Isaiah 1, chapter one, he says, man, all this stuff that you're doing, I'm actually sick of it. What I would rather you do is I would rather you stand up for justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the orphan and the widow. I want my people to be a people who help people in the earth, people that do the right thing in the earth. These problems that we're seeing in our world right now, the reason they exist is because the people of God have not taken that up and saying, this is my responsibility to be what God has made me to be in this place. James says that religion is pure in God's eyes is that we visit orphans and widows in their time of need, that we show up when people are in need. Let me put it like this. You know, I, I went to Nacogdoches High School grew up here, Nacogdoches kid, and have a little sister. And my sister, she just so happened to be in high school at the exact same time that I was, just a few years younger. So you can imagine what that would have been like for her. She has an older brother at the same school as her. So as you can imagine, her dating life was non-existent. Didn't happen. (laughs) Sorry, Morgan. I, I apologize. But the reason why that, that, that kind of was a, a thing that wasn't really present was because that, that, that these, these people that would be interested in her would have to take an evaluation of, do I like her enough to deal with her brother? Do I like her enough to, to like, if something were to happen, like Blake could probably kill me. Like, let me not, like, let me not do that. But like the reason, the reason why, uh, for me, why it, I kind of made this difficult for her was because, you know, I grew up with a dad who always told me that my job was to take care of my little sister, that it was my responsibility as the big brother to anytime anything were to happen to her, it was, it was my job to stand up and fight for her. When somebody hurt her, it was my job to protect her. If something were to happen, if someone were to be mean to her, it'd be my job to stand up for her. And that anybody that would mess with her had to think twice because they knew that they'd have to mess with me. I wonder what it would look like in our world if we decided that we were going to be the big brothers in the people's lives that need help. That if somebody said, I'm going through some stuff right now and there's some people that are hurting me right now and there's some situations that are going on, that we would be people that showed up and said, not on my watch, not on my little sister, heck nah, over my dead body. You're not going to get past me with that. Absolutely not. We see, when we see injustice happen in our world, it's the church's job to step up and say, not while I'm here. When we see people being used and abused and things like that, it's our job to stand up and say, that's not right. It's our job to comfort. It's our job to care. It's our job to protect. It's our job to image God's heart on the, on the earth. It's our job. God's given that to us. 
It's our job to step in when someone's life is on fire and help put it out. It's our job. It's our job. Not only that, are we not only supposed to be a church that shows up, a people that show up, we need to be a people that stay. We need to be a people that stay. You know, this early church that we talk about in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, right after this, they just endured extreme persecution. They would uh, basically have their homes taken from them, lives taken, everything, literally everything stripped from them. And they had each other care for each other in that time. But what, what happened, and I think some of you don't even know this, but the early church, if you were to look at like a, a, a graph or a chart of, of what it was primarily consisted of, it consisted primarily of women. Girl power. But the reason why the early church consisted primarily of women was not because there was just more women converts, but rather... There was, a, there was a system in place in Rome and in places like it that when you were born, a daughter was born, what they would do is they'd take that little girl and they'd put her on a trash heap and throw her away. And these Christians, these people of Jesus, they would walk by and see these babies on these, thing, uh, these, these just trash. Like Think of like a landfill. And they'd walk up and they'd grab that baby and they'd take them home as their own that they would take somebody who is not their problem, not their, not their responsibility, not their, not, nothing that they have to do with, like not even their kid, and they would take them as their own. Not only that, but it was the early church that started hospitals, that these people that faced worldwide pandemics, it was the church that stepped in and didn't walk away. It was the church that stepped right into the fire and didn't turn their back. It was the church that gave their life for other people. If we are ever going to be that for this world, we need to be people that stand up and stay no matter the cost. Where we can look people in their eyes on their worst day and say, hey, I'm not going anywhere. I know that those people abandoned you before, but I'm not going anywhere. I know that your mom or your dad or your boyfriend or whatever, I know that they left you and you've been wondering if you could ever trust someone again. You can trust me because I'm here for you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere that you're in need, you can come to me. You can call me. You can call me. I don't want to be a bother though. Like I don't want to, no, you can call me. 3 a.m., you can call me. You can show up to my house. You need food, you can show up to my house. Better yet, I'm coming to your house and I'm bringing dinner. That's the type of people that we need to be. Because here's the thing, you know people whose lives are on fire. Yours might even be. Man, it's our job to see that and move not wait for somebody else to come do it, but it's our job to stand up and stay for people. It's our job. Galatians 6.2 uh, 6, says that we are to bear one another's burdens. We are to carry one another's burdens. We are to carry each other through life. That's what this church did. This early church, they existed off shared need. That every single person had, a, had something happen. These people would have homes taken from them and other people with the home and say, hey, you can come live with us. I don't know how long it's going to be, but you can come live in our spare room. You can come live and sleep on my couch. You can come do... That's what the church existed off of. And guess what happened when they did that? It said that every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. You want to wonder why churches are dying off and people aren't coming to Jesus and people are giving up on church? Maybe it's because the church stopped being what the church was supposed to be. Where we have been selective in who we stay with. That we've decided, you know what? You look a little messy, like, I'm not going to even mess with that. Ah, you're too much. Too many problems. Ah, it's going to take too much of my time. Too much of my money. Hmm. I might, people might think of me differently if I, like, hang out with you because, like, the way you live your life is super messy. You know, like, who you choose to, like, sleep with is an issue. So, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to love you, actually. Like, get your stuff together and then come to church. Some of you, that's your experience with church. Some of you refuse to come into a place like this for so long because you believe that the people of this church or any church would just look at you and say, you don't have a place here. How dare you come in here with that? Meanwhile, the church was the only place that people are supposed to come into. That if the church was actually the church, maybe people would call and say, hey, you know what? I have a friend going through some stuff. Maybe, maybe this, I know this church that helps people, that has like these programs and things that they do just to help people. I know this one guy who was in my, my, my chemistry class last year that prayed for me in the middle of the class. It was the most awkward thing ever, but it helped me, it helped my day. What if we became people that decided that no matter what it looks like, we're going to go after people. We're going to stand in the fire. We're going to stand in the flames with people because that's what Jesus did for us. 
My last point tonight is that if we're going to be a church that the, the world makes way for, that people make way for, we need to be a church that keeps it simple. We need to be a church that keeps it simple. In the text, it says in verse 46, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and they broke bread from house to house and they ate their food with a joyful and generous heart. That word uh, that, that, that's translated as generous or as sincere or as whatever your translation is, some say humble heart. It's actually this word that I actually wrote down so I can, uh, I can say it. Give me a sec. It's this word, aphelotes, which is actually, I know you, have, you don't care at all, but it's a Greek word, but aphelotes. And what it is, it's, it's only used one time in the entire New Testament. In this entire book, it's used one time, and it's this time. It means, sim- it means simple, in simplicity of heart. Simplicity of heart. That it's the simple things, that they sat together and they ate together and they loved one another. And it was simple. It's all it was. You know, I, I think back to that whole idea, like this whole thing, this walking with Jesus thing. When I first came in, I thought, you know what? Walking with Jesus is like, you got to be on your P's and Q's. You got to like talk the right way, like look the right, like dress the right way. You got to, you know, have that whole church thing to you, you know? That's what you have to like walk the line. You have to do the thing, say the right thing, raise your hands the right way, like pray the right way. You have to do all these things. We make it really complicated. But really this thing with Jesus is actually really, really simple. In John chapter 13, oh, I kicked the thing. I was good for a sec. In John chapter 13, Jesus, he, he, on his last night on the earth, he, before he goes and he dies on the cross and he's resurrected three days later, on this last night, what he does is he brings his disciples into this upper room. And what they do is, is they, he, he gets on his hands and his knees and he washes his disciples' feet. And then right after that, he has this, this conversation, which is called the upper room discourse, if, if you like Bible things, this upper room discourse with them where he tells them things. And the one that sticks out the most and the thing that I think is most important, that is the actual essence of what this whole thing with Jesus is. He says, I give you a new command, a new commandment I give to you. Love one another, love one another, love one another, just as I have loved you. By this love, all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. This whole thing, this whole thing is loving God and loving people. And the thing is, the loving God part doesn't originate with you, it originates with him. The thing that we so often forget is that God himself saw our fire and he walked out of heaven, he became a man, and he gave his life, he stepped into the flames to save us. That he, he said, I'm going to show up in the middle of this mess. I'm going to stay. I'm not going to turn away. I'm going to give my life for these people. And all I'm asking them to do is love me and love, love the person next to you. You know, our world is so devoid of the greatest currency that we have as believers in Jesus. So devoid of love. This whole emptiness of love. People are going anywhere and everywhere they can to find love. But we have it and we're holding it to ourselves. What would it look like if we started to radically love people as Jesus has loved us? Where we are on our worst day, we can look at people on their worst day and say, you know what, I'm going to love you anyway because Jesus loved me like that first. I don't know about you guys, but I have no reason to be on the stage. I have no reason to ever stand up here and talk about how good God is. I have no reason to. No reason. Because man, I've blown it, man. I've made so many mistakes. I've made so many mistakes, and every day I wonder why God let me do this. You know, I, I knew that day God was calling me to be a fireman, but I didn't know it was, it was this kind of fireman. And who am I not to live the rest of my life trying to lay my life down for people, try to give up these things? It's hard sometimes, man. I'm going to be honest. I haven't shown up a lot of times. I haven't stayed. I've ran away, and I haven't kept it simple. I've made it real complex. And I made it about me a lot of the time. But man, this thing with Jesus, Jesus is calling you into a life where you're laying it down for other people. And the reason you can is because he did it for you first. And the more Jesus, the more you look at Jesus, the more you see his love for you, the more you can love other people. Now I'm convinced 
That if we were to be people that were so caught up in how Jesus has loved us and so convinced that his love for us can be the same how he loves someone else, that we could actually step out of our comfortable place and love somebody in a dangerous way, in a way that, that feels like it's too much. You know, because I've lived life long enough trying to secure things for myself to know that there's no life there. The only place that there's life is actually doing the thing that Jesus did. You know, I had a, I had a moment earlier in my life where, where I, I received God's love and I just, I, I took, took it, I took it. I was like, okay, God, I'll take my second chance. I'm gonna make the most of this chance. You know, I, I had, I was playing football at the time here at SFA and I had things like the world would tell you, oh yeah, this is great. But so empty, man. I was looking for life in every way I could find it. In people, in relationships, success, sports. And it wasn't until I stepped away from that and I got on a van to tell people about the God that saved me that I actually found something that meant something. The first time that I ever felt alive was the moment that I said, hey bro, to this drunk guy sitting next to me on a van, hey bro, I just want you to know God loves you. He has a purpose for your life. Your life can change in a year. Mine did. Four months ago, I was doing the same thing you were doing, looking for life in all the wrong places. I was in the same place. And I want to tell you right now that God loves you too much to leave you there. Don't you give up hope. I know that you're trying to find life in that bottle, but it's not there. It's in Jesus. And it was at that moment that I decided I will leave everything, every bit of what I thought my life was going to be, and I'm going to step into this thing with Jesus. And my encouragement tonight is not for you to just say, oh, that's nice, Blake. I know I'm supposed to help people. That's not it. I want you to be so wrapped up in God's love for you that it becomes so natural for you to see other people and love them too. Because I think the closer that we get to Jesus, the closer we get to loving other people. That the more we look to Jesus, the more we see that this life that we're actually designed to live is a one that's sacrificial. That Jesus, the greatest of them all, gave his life. He gave everything. Who are we not to give? Who are we not to love that person next to us? Who are we to not say, hey, man, I see what you're going through. I see what you're going through. But I want you to know right now that God's got so much for you. Hold on. Hold on in faith. So what I want us to do is I want us to stand up right now, and I want us to have a moment where we just say, hey, God, I've made this thing complicated. And I've, I've tried a lot of ways to do it my own way, but what I wanna do right now from today forward, I wanna take a step and say, God, I wanna be someone that shows up. I wanna be someone that shows up for people. I wanna be someone that stays when everyone else runs away. I wanna be someone that stays. And last, I wanna be someone that is so caught up in the love that has been shown to me that I'm willing to take that step. Because Jesus, you showed up for me and you stayed on my worst day and you love me enough to die for me. I wanna spend the rest of my life taking those steps. I wanna spend the rest of my life fighting those fires. I wanna spend the rest of my life putting those fires out. And some of you in this room right now, you're in a fire right now and you need some help. And what I wanna do right now is I want you to ask somebody next to you. If you know them, if not, that's cool. I want you to say, hey, I need some prayer right now. I'm going through something. Let someone else in this room help put a fire out because we got fires to fight can't do this thing alone a church is a family and we walk together as a family your problem is my problem it's not yours to carry alone there are people in this room that want to help there are people in this room that love you even though they've never met you and the reason why they love you is because the same Jesus that died for them they believe died for you and because of that that love can be extended it can be so right now if you would close your eyes I just want to lead you in a moment and right now I know that there's some of you that are going through some things and you're wondering when God's gonna show up. And I, I want you to know that maybe God's waiting for you to tell somebody to help. And if that's you, I just want, I just want you to say this prayer. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand or anything like that. I just want you to say this prayer. Dear Jesus, God, life is hard right now. God, I feel like I'm in the middle of the flames. But Lord, I believe that you left heaven and you stepped into this earth to put out fires, God, and to, to heal my heart. Lord, I pray that you would surround me with people to help me walk through this, God. 
Jesus, I pray that your presence would be so strong in my life right now, God, that you would give me the next steps to step out. For those of you that never even had a moment with Jesus ever in your life right now, I just want to let you have this opportunity to say, God, I want that life with you. Jesus, right now, I bend the knee, I bow the knee and say that you're Lord of my life. You're Lord of my life. Whatever you want, God, I'm in. Whatever you want, God, I'm in. And those of you that have, that have been in church, that have grown up in church, that, that, that know Jesus right now, I want to challenge you. In this moment, I want you to pray this prayer. God, make me a firefighter, God. Make me someone that, that loves to run into flames. God, make me someone that fights for people. God, make me someone that's not afraid of the fight. Help me to look like you, Jesus. Jesus.